ओम स्थापकाय ये धर्म से सर्व धर्म स्वरूप ने अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णाय ते नम अवर सैल्यूटेशंस टू श्री राम कृष्ण द इनकारनेशन सुप्रीम हु हैज फाउंडेड एंड स्टाब्लिश द ट्रू रिलीजन ऑफ दिस प्लैनेट एंड हु इज द रियलिटी ऑफ ऑल रिलीजन्स friends it is but meet and proper that we should also remember swami vivekananda his chief apostle because you know this is the year centenary year of the commemoration of the chicago parliament of religions and it would be quite fit and proper that swami vivekananda is also thought upon and reflected on this momentous day we know that each one was complimentary and supplementary to each other without swami vivekananda sri ram krishna sri ram krishna would have been unknown to this world so his contribution to this ram krishna vivekananda movement is most praise for the he was suppose if sri ram krishna was the text swami vivekananda was its commentary if sri ram krishna is treated as a flower Swami Vivekananda was its petal with fragrance. So both are very much important in this context. It is who, with the blessings and powers of Sri Ram Krishna, he crossed the oceans and appeared at the Parliament of Religions, and there he hoisted the flag of Vedanta in the Committee of Nations of this earth. and he boldly and it is he who boldly declared the inherent divinity of man and he pumped spiritual energy into the arteries and sinews and nerves of the whole mankind he it is he who gave trust and confidence into the supramental reality and actually brought the trust and validated the scriptural authority of all religions it is he who raised the slogan of harmony and tranquility of all religions and brought about the amity and friendship and fellowship amongst all fighting groups and religions the fallout of this parliament of religion has been tremendous the pope also later on declared that we have nothing to disagree, disagree. with other religions which so long they believe on god so these all this liberalism and catholicism that are now manifest in this world today and we are having interreligious dialogues with each other with a view to cooperation and exchange of notes is a pointer that the parliament of religion was a harbinger in this you see path in this uh, mission of assimilation and cooperation and this has much to do with the peace and harmony in this world it is swami vivekananda he came down on the earth we should not humanize him he was in something you see supramental something very much super conscious reality he was brought down on this planet by sri ram krishna spe- specifically for performing this task of his spiritual ministration we see that you see in the earlier days of baranagar mat we found we find in from the history of ram krishna mission once swami shivanand you see he writes in his memoirs that one day it so happened that his cot was empty and in the darkness he found the three luminous figures of shiva vishveshwar shiva you see existing or present on this cot he was a direct you know you see direct replica or personification of shiva in the form of swami vivekananda we also find also in the mary louise uh, burks you know research papers and the books that once on even in his life it has been incorporated now that once it so happened that he was a whole he was a guest in somebody's house and uh, before his lecture uh, before his lecture he was just looking uh, you see into the mirror and he was setting up his dress his turban his dress everything the the lady the host lady thought 
here I have caught this man. He talks of so much bodilessness and soul of the Atman without body. And today he's so much conscious of his physical fitness and body consciousness. I will take him to task. Swamiji understood. He completed his lecture. On the next day, he replied, he was an indwelling reality. He knew the innermost thoughts of every man. And according to the needs and circumstances, he used to give illumination. And he used to give the proper guidance in his spiritual te teachings. He said to the lady, the host, my dear, you don't know. I was going to speak, but I was not conscious of my body. I was so nervous, how I would speak? Where is my head? Where is my brain? Where are my feet? So by looking into the, meet, uh, into the mirror, I was trying to concentrate on my physical form. In this way, then the lady, you see, understood her mistake. Such was the personality of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, Sri Swami Vekananda. He was the illumination in personified. And by remembering him, you will, we will be purifying ourselves. We will be deifying ourselves into the, into the mold of Swami Vivekananda. We must study the lives of these holy persons, you know, with f firm faith and devotion and with a feeling, with heartfelt feeling, so that we may cast our life into the mold of their lives. Now, when we think of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, we are actually meditating our, in our own reality, because reality is one without second. Ek meva advitiyam. Many religions, many prophets, many incarnations have come. They have, you see, they have delineated the same one truth in different ways according to the climes and circumstances of our time and is suiting to the requirements and needs of the people they serve. But the truth is one, destination is one, mountain is one. There may be many paths to reach to the peak of that mountain. So where whatever, through whichever, through whomsoever you meditate and go, you will reach to the same pinnacle, to the same summit of the same mountain. So you, there should not be any conflict on this point. You know, I would refer to one, you see, very good uh, recent uh, happening, is an incident. Well, Father Griffiths, he was in South India, and our most were nun, she gave me some papers on his life, and I had the occasion to go through it. And I am also very doubly you know, fortunate, because I had had the opportunity to tune to the BBC radio at that time in Amsterdam when he had passed away. Very recently, 1993, he passed away. And the, an interview recorded, you see, by the BBC correspondent was broadcast, you see, in commemoration, as, uh, in commemoration of his death, and uh, death, uh, you see, in commemoration of his death. There, the representative of BBC, BBC pointedly, you see, put the question to him, how is that you are a Benedictine monk, a British extraction, you went to India to convert the people, and you are talking, you see, of, on the religion of heathens. Pagans, you are supporting them. How is he strange, you know, is, this, is a, this is the corollary. He said, my dear friend, my child, he is so wonderful. He has grown up so much spiritually. His every word was soaked in motherly love and affection. I was charmed by that interview. And one of our uh, devotees, perhaps, had written to the BBC for a copy of that tape record. He said, there is a big kashal, my dear child. In the kashal, there is a big, there is a little shrine. In the shrine, if you enter in the shrine, you will not find any east, west, north, west. Nothing, no distinction is there. There is only one that is peace and tranquility flowing, you see, eternally. I have realized the truth in my meditation. That was the reply to his question. So that is what is, you see, these, all these sevens, all these religious personalities, those who go to the highest, they hold the same way, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, as all jackals hold the same sound. Similarly, the realization, this thing is the only one and same. And that's why oftentimes Swami Vivekananda said, religion is realization. Religious life begins after your realization. Afterward, there are only conflicts, doubts, and there are distractions, temptations. So that these, because, because of that reason, Swami Vivekananda has defined religion that 
you see that all these books, temples, these rituals, and all these things, the forms, these are but secondary details. Each soul is potentially divine, and the goal is to realize this divinity within by controlling nature external and internal. Do this either by work, worship, psychic control or philosophy by one or more or all of these and be free. But our religion today is stuck up, has stumbled upon halfway. They have caught on these secondary details and they, are, they have not gone, you see, beyond these, uh, these limitations. That is true in the beginning preliminary, at the preliminary stage you require a temple. You require certain book to guide you, but that is not all. You may be born in the church, but you must not die in the church. God is all perfecting. There is nothing in this world which is not perfected and which is not inclusive of God. God is everywhere. And that is our main goal is to see God in every moment of our life, in thought within and in the external world. That is the main idea of all religions. Unless you reach and touch this stage of your spiritual life, you are bound and you are bound to be bounced back to this quagmire and life and death and you will roll on from, you see, through eternity in this miserable world of suffering. So whatever we may say, this is the whole gist of religion and that has been pointed pointed out by Sri Ram Krishna Vivekananda. And when Swamiji, when he said that once he was asked, uh, you see, what do you want? Swami Vivekananda said, oh, I want to merge the eternal ocean of nectar and you see, bliss. And uh, during times of food, I will come to the shore and take the food again. I will go back to and merge myself in the eternal, you see, ocean. So Sri Ram Krishna said, you are a fool. You are so selfish. I had great hopes about you. I thought you would be like a big banyan tree and under your shade thousands of people will take shelter and get the spiritual breeze. What are you talking about? So in this way and in one day Sri Ramakrishna forecast about him that Narain, his pre-monastic name, he would educate. And Swami Vivekananda, you see, he was adamant that he would not do it. But Sri Ramakrishna said, your bones should have to do it. So in this way, this spiritual relation, uh, mystical, this mysterious re spiritual relation, relationship was, you see, established in between them. And when he appeared at the Parliament of Religion, he was a man of realization. His voice was not the empty sound or empty voice of an academic or a professor, just chewing certain words and phrases and playing upon you see the jugglery of words and regaling and teasing the audience. That was not the fact with him. He is, each word was a nugget of truth which he had realized within. And that, that was reflection and ray of his own realization. Aparokshanubhuti, what he had realized he poured out through his speeches and words and that touched the heart of every man because truth is one and truth is within everybody. It is the, in the, the heart of hearts, in the cavity of our hearts that truth is installed and it is present, ever present there eternally. And that truth is waiting to be realized. It is we who are creating all obstacles. We, we don't see our, you see, to, to within. We are seeing outside for our titillation of loves, for the pulsation of little excitement and that's why we don't hear the voice of God and we don't hear the whispers of God. God is ever willing to help us, to lift us up, but we don't want to go to God. That is our irony of fate. And that's why when he said sisters and brothers, he never said, you see, just like we a professor, we say the sisters are there and we are here just a uh, an expression of euphemism, just to please the people, like just a good sound, that's all right. But he, he fell from the father, they have come, I have come. Both we are brothers, both we are sisters, no difference. This, who has, those who have seen the father has seen, who have, those who have seen the son have seen the father. There is an underlying unity, the subst unity at the substratum. The origin is the same. He felt that at the origin, 
there is no difference. We are all one. How can there be difference in the manifestation? So that consciousness, unitary consciousness of oneness was prevailing in his psychosis. And with that consciousness, he completely mesmerized the whole audience. When he uttered these two, three, four words, the people rose up, uh, you see, in their seats clad for two, three minutes. That was the ovation, not ovation to Swami Vivekanand because he was a principle of realization. That realization is within us. We have to realize that thing, not simply talk about. You can talk about, you see, hundreds of uh, times. You can write volumes of books. You can, you see, plays and uh, you see uh, the intellectuals, the audiences, but it is very difficult to live a a one moment of his spiritual life and much less to realize the truth. But he had realized the truth. He knew that the truth was within his palm. And he held within his palm all the minds, all the souls of his audience. He, that's why he, you see, conquered the whole world by his spiritual power, not by military power, not by intellectual or economic power, but the power of his realization. That was the message Swami Vivekananda gave us, gave to us during the Parliament of Religion. He thought that Parliament of Religious was nothing new to him because he knew his guru's life was nothing but a Parliament of Religions. He himself had found the meeting ground of all religions in his life. And he has observed that thing, and that thing he just, you see, uttered and proclaimed to the West what he has seen and realized himself, that very unitary, you see, consciousness of all religions. That was the fact with him. And before you see this, see this uh, uh, Swamiji's life, prior to the parliament of religions, he told Swami Turyanand, another spiritual giant, who won for two years in the States, and he reformed and, you see, shaped and transferred many people's lives. And still, he's revered, very much remembered in all the articles and books I have seen. There he told Swami Turyanand that this parliament is being held for me. Before that, long before that, and if it had not been, you see, if it had been uttered by the lips of some other persons, then you would have been, you know, stigmatized as a patient of megalomania. But he was a spiritual giant. And what he uttered, because a man of realization, what does he do? You know, realization means the world is false, they realize it. And they become the completely epitome or replica of the truth. And the world for them, the whole world is false. Whatever they will, the nature like a slave follows the word and the command of the life soul. He is more powerful than atom bomb. He had told that I will explode on the society like a bomb. And actually, he exploded like a nuclear explosion. There is no nuclear explosion explodes on the external world. But he has exploded in our internal world. And it takes time, you see, for the concretization, for the materialization of such a spiritual, subtle explosion. Slowly, slowly, the world and the people will come under his sway, under his thoughts. And thousand and one ways he is operating, we don't know. I happened to attend one meeting. You see, there are many monks from other orders, Mandaleshwar from northern India, they had gathered there. And the subject was the birthday of Swami Vivekananda. We think that we belong to order, and Swamiji is our captive, and we are the only monopolist to pro understand and proclaim his ideas. That is a very false notion. Because I saw one Swami from another aspect, he is uh, another, you see, uh, organization. He spoke so brilliantly on Swamiji's life. I was ashamed. I was humbled. He had gone so deep into his life. Once I was going to Reserve Bank of India, you know, for getting some pee from, because some of our brothers, they come to the States and other countries. Another monk was going for himself for getting the clearance, that fee, pee form clearance from Reserve Bank. I said, you have got a very fragile, brittle knowledge of English and no education. What would you do? Who would, who would protect you if you go to foreign country, in a foreign country? Then he took out from his pocket the picture of Swami Vivekananda. 
he is my protector. I am always remembering, and he belonged to another organization. So see these things through Nivedita, he also unleashed a wave of a certain, in the spirituality through political, you see, avenue, political channel. So he is so multifacial and multi-purpose that we cannot, you see, to, as uh, Descartes, some philosopher, has said about God, to define him is to limit him. So it is also equally true in case of Swami Vivekananda. If we define him, his grandeur, his spiritual splendor is to limit him, to confine him, rather to humiliate him. He's so all-pervading, and he has said, I am a voice without a form. I, will, I have no form. When he cast away, cast off his body, he appeared before Swami Ram Krishnanand in Madras, and he told Shashi, I have spat upon this body. He had no consciousness of physical, you see, you see uh, appear, uh, physical bodies. He regarded all these things as bag and baggage, baggages. When this bag is torn, we throw away, like worn out garment. He similarly was the case of Swami Vivekan, not only Vivekan, but all the realized persons of all religions. That is the you see, distinction that we have to remember always you see, while performing spiritual practices. With body, he used to say that the greatest mythology is that, you see, that the world is real. We create fantasies, Disneylands and all these things in our consciousness. We, some, we entertain and recreate ourselves with certain temporary, you see, objects. After they are destroyed, we become unhappy. But he said the greatest lie of the lies is that we are bodies. So these things we have to principle, and how to realize it, because all of a sudden, he, we cannot go and climb up to do that highest pedestal of this, is, this uh, Advaitic philosophy. Slowly, slowly, you have to climb up the rungs of this ladder. All of a sudden, you cannot go and proclaim, I am Brahman, you are Brahman. No, there is a subconscious, thousands of lives we have lived in the past through many incarnations, and today, you see, we are the byproduct of those incarnation is this life. And so naturally, we have to go in a very, very, you see, cautious and careful manner. That is the way and the best way he has churned out all the essence of religions, you know, from the different religions, spiritual practices, in the forms of four yogas, Gyar yoga, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, Prem Yoga, all these things, and mind is always, you know, dabbling and meddling in so many ways. And according to the movements of your mind, according to the disease of your mind, you have to give the medicine. And these yogas are readily available at you. And so the best way is that love, Bhakti Yoga. It is, I think, if I believe that Bhakti Yoga is the highest culmination of concentration. When you, your concentration is perfect, you, you become a lover. You, beca you become a lover of your ideal. I remember one incident, you know, one soldier with a dagger on around his belt, he was praying to God according to his uh, tenets of religion. At that time, a young girl, she had an appointment with her lover in the garden. And seeing the lover, that young girl so much became ecstatic and full of joy, that she trampled upon the body of that soldier who was praying, you see, by lying down on the ground. And he just walked away over him, r rather ran over, over, uh, over her, his body. And then the soldier became so much annoyed and angry upon the girl. How is that you have despoiled, despoiled and defiled my prayers to the Almighty? So then the girl replied, that fie upon your love to God. Seeing the secular lover, I lost consciousness of the whole environment and the whole garden and your presence. I ran like a blind, you see, blindfolded, you see, person. I never saw your body. And you are loving God, and you, by my, you see, trampling upon your body, you became so disturbed that you are angry upon me. See, this is how you see, you see, thin, how shallow is your love for God. For the, some, for the first time, the soldier with a you see, uh, uh, hefty physique and muscular body started trembling before a frail and very lean and thick girl. 
So this uh, you must remember when we love, we must pour our entire body, mind and soul into the love of God. So this way we have to love God and Sri Ram Krishna. He has come upon this earth out of infinite compassion for the mankind. We have to bring that feeling within our spiritual, that fervor has got to be, you see, cultivated and nurtured by performing our spiritual practice. The great reality, the formless, transcendental reality, where the senses cannot dare touch that reality, they go, they come back, being, you know, you see, being <laughs> unsuccessful to reach their transcendental, superconscious, super sensuous reality, that reality has taken the body of senses. And why to make God of man? So that idea that you have to, you have to feel it. So if in this way we can cast our entire spiritual being into his being, and then we can rise to the spiritual pinnacle of success. That is the secret and mystery of his spiritual you see, life. So this spiritual life is very difficult by reading books and cramming of these mantras and slokas. You cannot go for the time, it's all right, but you cannot go very far. So if you want to go, you see, deeper, on the deeper levels of your existence, your spiritual existence, you have to read and reflect their life and create that consciousness with which they lived, that mind, that awareness, all those qualities have to be cultivated slowly with love and affection and faith. And discarding all conflicts, all these things are bunkum as bunkum, as false, because he is the only truth, absolute truth. When he is the only reality, how can there be so realities you see apart from him? That could not be. All our things are nothing but hallucination, and you see our false notions. So these things we have to do. Now, in this way, like Gopi Madans, they were not scholars. They had not read all these uh, your scriptures. They had not uh, heard sermons and big, big words and phraseology of the spiritual life, nothing. And so they were simple village Madans without any learning. They realized God, they used to say, they used to worship, you know, Sri Krishna. And what is their idea of Sri Krishna? Not a cow herd boy. This Nakhalu Gopika Nandan Bhavan Akhila Dehinam Antaratma Drig. They used to look upon Sri Krishna as the Dehi, as the indwelling reality of all the bodies of the earth, the, the of whole cosmic world. He used to see that the, he is the owner of that body, all the bodies. In this way, by thinking upon, the, uh, upon him in such a manner, they realized the truth. They were simple, innocent, unblemished ladies, like children. They did not know anything about all these philosophies, all these dialectics of our argumentation. These are nothing but ego egotistic vibrations, because it only puffs up our pride but they are simple village maidens. They used to think upon Sri Krishna in that way. So when Uddhav when Sri Krishna left Vrindavan, they used to, you see, weep and they become, used to become unconscious. In Bhagavatam, you will find when the Parikshit is reciting these verses, the cantos of Bhagavatam to Parikshit, or uh, uh, Sukhadev is reciting, and he says to Parikshit, you see, see Parikshit king, these of outwardly, they appear to be unconscious, but inside, the, in their beings, inside their subconscious, they are one with reality, Sri Krishna. They have realized the truth. In this way, when you know they started bewailing and crying and screaming for the, you see, for the desertion of Sri Krishna because he had moved away to Dwarka, that is the, you see, the, I am telling you the, what is the gist, what is the central focal point of love. Just to illustrate this point, I'm just telling you, because example is better than precept. And we can follow these such examples in our daily spiritual life. My subject is spiritual life. So what happens, you know, then he sent his friend Uddhav. He believed in the formless of God. He came and explained to village maidens, why are you screaming? What is Sri Krishna? Well, he is pervading everywhere. Why do you think on the principle existence? He is not, he cannot be a man like this. 
So the Gopi maidens replied, "My dear Yudha, don't you know we had we have no two, three, five, ten minds. We had only one. We have only one mind, and that mind is with Sri Krishna. And what can you do? We have no other mind to think on your principle of philosophy and formless and all these things. And you see, Uthra got so much disappointed, and he was crestfallen, and he took the dust of the." You see, uh, Gopi maddens. This is the secret of love that we have to cultivate in our life, and that is that is the main purpose. You know, be this we, this will unite you, and without love we cannot succeed. And that's why the, we must, of course, Sri Ramakrishna used to tell Naradiya Bhakti. What is Naradiya Bhakti? Naradiya Bhakti is that you are love for God should be fried in the knowledge of and. You see, dipped in the syrup for God. So these bhakti and knowledge, your otherwise bhakti simply, you know, it it will be an emotional type of bhakti, which Swami Ji has also criticized. Emotional is generally biological. You see, it doesn't take you very far. So this emotion should be interlinked uh, with knowledge, with tranquil mind. And when these two knowledge and love, real love, super sensual love. Which is which is non biological. When they when these two things are combined, then you have a vision of God. This is the main thing. Otherwise, it is simply if you become simply sentimental, it will be a tear jerker, you know, exercise exercise in futility, and there will be so many reactions afterwards. And even if you are You see, dealing in this dry, cut and dry knowledge portion, you will be an egoist person, always willing to you see doubt persons and giving sermon this and that. That is also very dangerous. In the spiritual life, we come for doing karma yoga, but when we become very giant social workers, physicians, accountants, and we come to preach, you know, and we become great orators, but our hearts become dry because without any realization, we become a completely frustrated lot. So there are dangers everywhere. Chudas chadhara nishita duratya. So this is like a spiritual life. At every step of your life, this is like as if you are walking on a dangerous edge. You should be. Your eyes should be open. Your ears should be open. All these organs God has given you to discriminate against. You see false notion against wrong ideas. To hear the correct words. And brain, you are, he has given to understand through your intellect, to your intelligence, what is real, what is unreal, and then according to your own spiritual life, you have according to your own spiritual necessity, you have to go on in your life. So in this, what the hell and heaven are within us. There is one one widow, you know. One day through seance, he she called the split of her late husband. And uh, she asked uh, the, uh, the medium. Uh, the uh, to, to, she asked her husband, "Oh, Peter, how you are?" He said, "I'm very, very happy." See, you are just uh, where are you residing? I'm residing in a very good place, very beautiful, very you see comfortable. Nothing you see wrong with it. Then heaven must be very beautiful. Then she said, "It is not heaven, my dear." So that is obviously he was in the hell. But the hell was more beautiful than this earth. He wanted to say that thing. So he, so the lady said, "You are more happier uh, than you are with me." Of course, he said, "I am more happier." You see, and, but he was deciding in hell. But he, that hell was heaven for me, for him. So you can understand. So the, you can understand. The hell and heaven can be created here itself. Swami Ji says, "There doesn't hell doesn't lie over or under." This whole, the this, if you think that there will be gods and goddesses, when your consciousness is developed, this whole earth you see becomes into heaven. The same very consciousness, all the only there is a trans metamorphosis of this very earthly plane into that plane of which you had been dreaming of, or you see you had been so much meditating and aspiring for. That is all that happens. So hell and heaven, all these things are within. So these things, it is within us to create heaven or hell by right conduct, by right 
thinking as buddha said by right resolution by right means of livelihood when because these things are to be done in a very rightful way why because we want to create the state of a tranquil mind because in a tranquil mind you can only concentrate on god if you involve entangle yourself in so many actions of desire this and that you will be always distracted and disturbed in that disturbance you cannot think on the transcendental reality so we must try to minimize as sri ramakrishna says one by one slowly by gradual process all your desires knowing that this world is false this world has no meaning nobody has got peace and happiness from this world nobody you search the histories all because all these religions big sevens all they have to leave this world one day whether you are a king or whether you are an ordinary man this is the very nature of this earth because one day sri ram krishna found hidey ram has bought a one calf sri ram krishna says what you will do with this calf So Hidaram, his nephew says, "I when it becomes, I will send it to my village, and what will happen? It will grow up and it will become a bullock, and with this bullock I will plow my agricultural field." I, Sri Ramakrishna says, "I nearly fainted." See the madness and craziness of this boy. If the world were true like that, he is talking about, I have completely metal. You see, created this whole world with gold, but it is not true. so we must remember this very much incident and uh, you see my time is up i am very much thankful to you om asato ma sadagamay tam so ma jyotirgamay mitto ma mitangamay om shanti shanti sam o lord lead us from falsehood to truth from darkness to light and from death to immortality Peace, peace, peace to every one of us. Thank you very much.